Hello. Hello and welcome to today's panel discussion, The Road to 2030, Trades Contractors and the Federal 2030 Emissions Reduction Plan. This online panel discussion is being presented by HPAC and Electrical Business Magazines. My name is Doug Picklick, editor of HPAC Magazine, and I'd like to first say a huge thank you to our two sponsors of today's Road to 2030 discussion, Eaton and Mitsubishi Electric Heating and Cooling. Thank you both for your support for this very topical discussion. Now I'd like to introduce our panel. First, Kevin Spencer is the Vice President of Energy Solutions with Modern Niagara, a national mechanical and electrical contracting company with locations in Ottawa, Toronto, Southwestern Ontario, Calgary, Edmonton, and Vancouver. Kevin has over 30 years of experience with Modern Niagara in various roles. He is a licensed heating, refrigeration, and air conditioning technician, a licensed gas fitter, and also a certified energy manager. Also with us is Jeremy Sager, a senior HVAC and renewables research engineer with CanMet Energy, a research and, and development arm of Natural Resources Canada. Jeremy has over 20 years of experience in assessing the performance of innovative heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and renewable energy systems. He's undertaken several technology assessment projects of HVAC and renewable energy systems at the Canadian Centre for Housing Technology and in the lab, including assessments of zoned systems, combination space and water heating systems, cold climate air source heat pumps, and solar assisted air source heat, pump, heat pumps, among others. And we also have Martin Limas, Vice President of Government and Stakeholder Relations for the Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Institute of Canada, the National Association for the HVACR Industry. With HRAI for over 25 years, Martin is responsible for the government relations and industry advocacy work of the association. Prior to joining HRAI, Martin was a project director for the Social Investment Organization, a research director for the Independent Power Producer Society of Ontario, and a research associate and sessional sorry, lecturer at the University of Toronto, where he also earned his Master of Arts degree in urban geography and planning. And also joining us is Gurvinder Chopra, Vice President Standards and Regulations with Electro Federation Canada, a not-for-profit association of Canadian electrical manufacturers, distributors, and manufacturing agents. Gurvinder is responsible for initiatives around the development of standards, codes, and regulations, and focuses on changes to product testing and certification requirements in support of innovations happening within the electrical sector. He leads the advocacy efforts with municipal, provincial, and federal governments on codes and regulations topics, and actively pursues initiatives around clean energy, modernization of the grid, electrical vehicle systems, and the aging electrical infrastructure. Welcome everyone, and thank you for being here today. For years, the uh, building industry, specifically the mechanical uh, industry, has been hearing a lot about decarbonization and, and electrification as the primary road to achieving a net zero carbon solution for heating and cooling homes and buildings. And this shift has definite ramifications for mechanical and electrical contractors. The 2030 Emissions Reduction Plan that was released on March 29th by the Environment Minister is a 271 page document that includes $9.1 billion in new investments designed to ensure that Canada re will reduce emissions across the, entire, across the entire economy to reach an emissions reduction target of 40 to 45% below our 2005 levels by 2030. And this will put the country on a path towards achieving net zero emissions by 2050 a commitment made as part of the Paris Agreement. Among the spending in the 2030 plan, there is $150 million towards the Canada Green Buildings Strategy, 
working Canada-wide to develop new policy, incentives, and standards to drive new construction and retrofits of existing building stock towards the highest zero carbon standards. It's clear the momentum to lead this change is gaining urgency. Now, while we wait for more prescriptive measures from policymakers to push the industry in this direction, we've assembled this panel today to find out how contractors can get out in front of these inevitable changes. So let's begin. And first, Kevin, I'd like to ask you as part of a large Canadian mechanical and electrical contracting company, is Modern Niagara already experiencing client demand for decarbonization, electrification, or net zero solutions? And how are you investigating and promoting these solutions for both new builds and retrofit situations today? Thank you, Doug, and uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, certainly the demand for decarbonization has started, for sure it has started. Um, New builds, I, I, I see it in the two different categories you talked about. For new builds, um, you know, there's, there's uh, especially for government projects, there's a, certainly a focus on GHG, whether the Toronto Green Building Standard or um, a lot of the private public partnerships we work on, uh, there's certainly a GHG target that must be met by the team that's designing and building the facility, and it has to operate that way as well. So the outcomes have to be there. Um, Existing buildings for me fall into two, two categories, really. There's the category of businesses that have stated reduction goals for themselves, and they're currently either they're, they're either currently working on those or they're beginning to work on those reduction goals. Some have been doing it for years now. Um, it's the second category that we see the challenge with, and that is the buildings and the, or the businesses that are really in a wait and see kind of mode. And, and a lot of that sometimes is driven by the complexity of building ownership property managers and, and the tenants are separated from the ownership of the building. So not an easy task, um, but uh, I, I think your question specifically was, what are we doing at Modern? Well, we are, we are I lead an energy solutions group. So I have a, a number of en energy engineers and HVAC technicians that are, are uh, working for me and working for Modern and looking for better ways to improve not just the energy efficiency of buildings, but now we're switching over to help our clients decarbonize and, and electrify. Right. So those things are happening today. People yeah. are pushing forward with these. There are companies, a lot of progressive companies are pushing forward today, absolutely. Yeah. And transitioning from gas fired to electrical uh, systems? Let me, let me clarify that, that the, the actual transitioning may not be taking part today. They're planning for that today. Um, yeah. The transitioning will happen over a time period, I feel, between now and 2030. It's that, okay. that other group of businesses that are, there are a lot of businesses out there that are a wait and see that maybe don't have stated goals. Right. Okay. Jeremy, I was going to go to you next, because I know your work focuses a lot on the residential side, specifically looking at heat pump technology, a solution that's being heavily promoted in most jurisdictions across Canada. What are the key issues you've found that HVAC contractors need to be aware of to get themselves and homeowners on board with electrification and maybe even just heat pump technology in particular? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Doug. Thanks for the question and thanks for the opportunity um, to participate today. I guess one of the first things that comes to my mind is that you know, we, we need to get past the assumption that heat pumps um, don't work in cold climates or don't work as well in cold climates. I think there's a, a reputation there that the industry's had and contractors themselves maybe don't have faith in the technology based on past experiences of maybe fixing ones that broke. Um, but we've done testing on this technology in our lab, lots of different systems, single stage, two stage, variable capacity systems. And we've seen that the systems do perform well, um, even in cold temperatures. So, uh, and some systems perform down to minus 30 Celsius. So we know there's there's options out there that perform well. And I would say that um, there's options available for every homeowner too, whether they want to go, you know, all in and fully electrify um, with maybe a cold climate air source heat pump and electric backup, or whether they want to, you know, sort of chip away at it with say. Um, 
a dual fuel system or a hybrid system and perhaps add a, a heat pump to an existing gas furnace, for example, or if they're in an electric baseboard home and, and you know, they're just trying to uh, displace some of their loads. So I think the options are there. And I, I think, you know, contractors have um, an opportunity to offer these different options to, to homeowners. And on that front, I think there's a need to um, build awareness with contractors and, and build the, um, the need for sizing and selection into the business model so that there's time to properly size and select systems. I know that's not something that's um, you know, commonly done. It's, it's not often in the scope, or if it is, it's, it's perhaps not the, the majority that do that. So I think that would help us get there. Um, I think uh, calculating proper design heat loss and heat gain is something else that needs to be done to make sure we're getting the systems in the right size to address the, the load. We don't want to oversize if you don't want to undersize. And um, the way to do that is to, to know what our, our uh, heat loss and heat gain is. And that's something else that I think is, is done commonly in new builds, um, but retrofit, I, I don't think it's done very often. And it just needs to be built into that, that business model again, taking the time and conveying, I think communicating the benefits of doing that so that homeowners are maybe willing to pay a couple hundred bucks extra on their five to ten thousand dollar system you know to get that proper calculation done to make sure it's going to perform the best it possibly can um and then yeah I, I think just commissioning to the need for robust commissioning procedures um making sure that the airflow is, is as it needs to be to ensure the system can perform as expected you know proper placement of the outdoor unit a bunch of other things that maybe i can get into later but yeah. Right. And, and when we talk about uh, heat pumps and, and the cold weather, um, there's still uh, often the, a need for um, uh, a, a backup heat source in, in most cases. I mean, do you see that going forward regardless? I think as we move towards higher performance homes um, that bring the loads down substantially and as we retrofit our existing stock, uh, I think we're going to move into a time where, you know, a fully electric system with electric backup is very feasible, um, where, you know, we can move completely away from fossil fuels, uh, you know, for, for locations that have a, a very high performing boiler or, or furnace, um, then adding an air source heat pump to it, to me, makes a lot of sense in the near term. Thank you. Um, Martin, I... Uh... Just curious to know what you're hearing from the HVAC industry across the country, contractors and manufacturers, uh, when it comes to this push towards net zero emissions. This isn't new necessarily, but uh, what are you hearing? And is it too much too fast? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Doug. And I, I would like to thank you too for uh, allowing me to join this discussion, a very important one for the industry. Um, I will say that, uh, first of all, I have to say the industry is not a monolith. There isn't a single reaction. There's not a single perspective on this. Sometimes it makes it a challenge for me and others, probably Gurvinder too, having to speak on behalf of industry. There isn't always a unified voice on these matters. Um, but I will say that the uh, attitudes within the industry today range from um, eagerness on uh, the part of some to skepticism and maybe complacency on the part of others who, you know, a bit of a wait and see attitude. Some will be whole hum and some would be very skeptical about whether or not we can get there from here. We hear all versions of that. Um, from our manufacturer members, it very much depends on their product mix clearly, the extent to which they have products that are electrified versus uh, fossil fuel dependent uh, will to some extent determine their positioning on this. And among the contractors, <clears throat> I'm going to say the range of uh, views I, I already expressed, uh, it's a very small percentage of people who are very eager to get into this. Um, but on the other hand, we have people who, are, who remain skeptical. And I'm going to say part of the reason for that is they've seen different signals coming from governments, uh, maybe utilities as well. They've heard different bits of information coming forward. They've seen commitments and then withdrawals from uh, you know, low carbon uh, programs and, and policies. So that creates a bit of a, an uncertainty around where we're going. And you know, for contractors to invest in the future of their businesses in terms of 
product mix and, and uh, trained uh, employees requires clear signals from government. However, I will say, I think more and more our membership is getting the sense that this is an inevitability and they need to start preparing. So where there is apprehension within the contracting community, it's mainly about uh, reskilling and, and retraining of their workers. That's probably the biggest challenge that the industry faces. I'm going to say, kind of like what Jeremy said, you know, we have the technology on the heating side. There are ways to uh, heat homes and buildings electrically, uh, provided they're designed properly and specified and so on. But the technology exists where the greatest gap exists in the industry today is in uh, the, the uh, number of properly trained technicians and even, you know, salespeople who can talk about these products in a, in a way that overcomes fears and uh, concerns that uh, consumers might have. And we can talk, I think we will talk a little bit later about how to overcome yeah. some of those, uh, those barriers, but I'll yeah. come back to that. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Gervinder, um, with respect to the road to 2030, electrification, it affects facets of life, um, many facets, uh, including there's, there's going to be electrical ve electric vehicles, um, electrifying industrial operations, as, as well as the heating and cooling of buildings. Um, how do you see electrical manufacturers playing a role in accommodating these changes? And from your knowledge, will our grids be able to handle the surge? I know that's a concern of many people uh, when it comes to electrification of our entire economy, as it were. Uh, thank you, Doug. And thanks from my side as well for including me in this discussion. So when it comes to clean energy or reducing carbon emissions, electricity has and will play an important role in achieving those goals, right? Uh, many responsible manufacturers have already aligned themselves or are aligning uh, towards sustainable goals. Uh, research and development teams are spearheading their product designs in that direction. So uh, electricity, uh, we talk about electrical grids and electrical products are all going through a transformation as technology and innovation are disrupting the traditional models from, from electric, electricity generation to beyond the meter. And so there are three trends that may be converging to produce these disruptions. One is focus on transportation. We all know transportation sector is one of the top contributors to greenhouse gases, apart from electricity production using fossil fuels, uh, or uh, when we talk about industrial, residential, and commercial sector consumption. So transportation is one of them. Number two is decentralization. We have heard all these buzzwords, uh, distributed energy resources, DERs, uh, where we talk about distributed storage or distributed generation and, and demand flexibility and energy efficiency. And the third trend is about digitalization. So digitalization of the grid and with you know all these smart metering and smart sensors and automation and beyond the meter, uh, when we talk about uh, internet of things or, or power consuming connected devices. So these are the trends and this is already happening within the electrical sector. You mentioned about the grid capacity and the concerns. So uh, yeah, although headlines do warn the public about potential risk of blackouts, you know, and the public is scared because of whatever we are hearing on the social media, but it is very clear from many studies and studies have been done across the world, uh, especially in the developed countries, that unless there is a sudden upsurge in the use of uh, loads, electric vehicles being one of them, the current power system is capable of absorbing additional loads. Now, uh, mind you, this is for short-term handling of additional load. For longer term, yes, there is certainly a need for investments and uh, operational adjustments, which would help in meeting the new consumption uh, patterns. Now, this may require, for example, high capacity distribution transformers, uh, smart charging systems, maybe better energy management system, uh, replacing aging inefficient electrical infrastructure, which is very important in Canada, and of course, using energy efficient products. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Kevin, I wanted to go back to you and, and just thinking about the transition from, from burning fossil fuels to electrification, that's a, a huge shift for, 
the owners and operators of existing buildings. I think you kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, I'm just curious what kinds of business opportunities does this open up for contractors and are the existing incentives that are out there enough to get building operators on board? Like what's, what is, what's your, how do you get into this uh, business? So yeah, just to, just to tag on to Mark, Martin and Jeremy both touched on this, but you know, heat pumps are very real today. They do work very good. Um, they're, they're super efficient. So I, I think the opportunity for, for contractors is absolutely massive. Um, Martin also touched on, you know, it, it's inevitable. This is coming at us in one way, shape or form. And yes, all the government messaging doesn't seem to be uniform across the, across the country right now, but um, you know, the, the typical course of action for life cycle replacement is going to be disrupted. Um, we're going to have to stay ahead of this and we're not just going to be able to swap out equipment anymore. So I think the opportunity is huge if, if, if um, contractors want to invest in, in training and technology. So um, current incentives, are they enough? I think we're just, I think we're finding our way through the incentive path. So incentives have changed a lot as we're shifting from energy-based incentives to carbon-based incentives. So my short answer though would be no, I don't think they're enough right now. Um, some of the existing incentive programs are very narrow and focused and uh, they require a lot of expertise to navigate and file for these incentives. So uh, just an example, the, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank has a, has a great decarbonization funding available, um, but it's a minimum 25 million. So you need, to, you need to either have a large project or go through an aggregator or become an aggregator. But um, yeah, I, I have faith we'll get there, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, we need to get moving. Uh, Jeremy, back to you. I, you'd mentioned this, but heat, heat pump technology has been around for, for decades, really, I believe. And uh, the early, early limitations in colder weather has led to some setbacks in adoption here in Canada. But as you mentioned, a lot has changed. So I was curious, based on your research, what, uh, what do contractors need to know to get the most out of today's technology? And what challenges could we potentially face with the electrification of all heating and cooling systems in homes. You know, picking up a bit on Kevin's point, I think um, there is an opportunity, you know, there will be some replacements and uh, change out of systems, but I think there's also opportunity for, you know, things like uh, in the residential area when there's an AC replacement, let's look for ways to, to swap out for an equivalent capacity heat pump. Um, if that's what the homeowner is looking for, they just want an air conditioner. Let's look for a way to upsell the opportunity to go heat pump and, and just get that air conditioner out of the cycle and get a heat pump into those houses. Because I think at the end of the day, you know, the more we can get heat pumps into people's houses, the more costs are going to come down, the more they're going to become a commoditized item like, like a furnace is for, for the average homeowner. Um, also, I, you know, our research has shown that... Um, that if you do go this route, you, you can still generate 25 to 30% GHG reductions if you swap out an air conditioner with a like-for-like like heat pump. So it's not to say you won't be able to still get GHG reductions if, if you do that. Um, I think, you know, what contractors need to know is, is again, I think, um, you know, Martin touched on it too, is that there, there is a, a learning that needs to take place and getting up to speed with how to sell heat pumps and, and uh, you know, where they make the most sense and what the opportunities are and, and, you know, being aware that, you know, in, in jurisdictions like Ontario, where there's time of use pricing, um, it might be a good idea to have smart switching controls if you're going to use a hybrid system or a dual fuel system and have that heat pump operating with a furnace, just to ensure that the homeowner does get the least cost um, heating system operating at all times so that they're, they're going to get the most out of their system. And I would encourage contractors and distributors to ask for these kind of um, capabilities from their equipment suppliers. I, I realize, you know, not everybody's offering um, things like smart switching controls, but if, if the contractors and distributors start conveying the need for that, I think the market will move in that direction. And in terms of challenges that we could potentially face with electrification of, of heating and cooling systems, um, you know, Kind of alluding to what I spoke about earlier, if, if we don't have proper heat loss and heat gain, 
calculations done and we don't size the system properly, I think there's an obvious risk to oversizing or undersizing and sort of going down the poor performance path, which we want to avoid. Um, same with proper commissioning. Uh, we don't want to go down a, a path of, of suboptimal performance and having systems cycling on and off. And that can deteriorate the lifespan of the equipment and, and as well just deteriorate the performance. I've seen challenges with controls. Uh, some of the heat pumps, the variable capacity heat pumps, there does, does need to be a control setup done uh, on the system. So, you know, you need to have a good, uh, good linkage. The contractor needs to have a good linkage with somebody who's aware of the controls, get it set up properly. Sort of more on the ground things, a few things that I'll, I'll just mention quickly. Noise can be a challenge. Some systems, when they're performing at very high loads, they're working hard, uh, the compressor's ramped up to a high speed, there can be some high frequency resonance. And we've heard some challenges with that. So knowing when to you know, install a system on a ground mounted pad instead of mounted against the side of the house so that it doesn't reverberate that resonance in the house and just looking for equipment with lower noise ratings, right? Going after something at in the 50s or 60 decibel rating at full load versus 70s is gonna get you a, a product that's gonna perform at um, perform more quietly. And then lastly, I'll just touch on, um, as it relates again to air source heat pumps is defrosting and just making sure that, uh, that the unit is set up with a snow guard if it's vertically discharging, you know, if it's horizontally discharging, using a wind guard, if it's especially in a windward location, um, just to make sure the unit's going to be able to perform when, when it's in our cold climates and we have snow falling or freezing rain, you know, these kind of things that we get. And uh, yeah, and I, I just think being aware of, the, of those challenges. And, you know, I, I think there's also an opportunity for ground source systems and uh, being aware of when is the right opportunity for ground source systems and, and trying to, uh, trying to, you know, Get the get homeowners aware of the opportunity, especially in community um, projects. Uh, there might be opportunity to go that direction. So I think we need to be aware of that as well. Yep. Very good. Yeah. Martin, I know um, ultimately uh, the industry is aiming to reduce emissions across the country and, and it's our entire society, customers, consumers, and industry is being asked to wean off of fossil fuels for powering our vehicles and heating our buildings. It's a true shift in culture going on. I'm just curious how you see the HVAC industry, contractors and manufacturers, again, taking a leadership position in this. Um, how does the industry get out in front of this, uh, these changes? Uh, <clears throat> very good question. And I'm gonna, I, I would say I'll answer that at two levels. One is um, what can the industry at large collectively do to show leadership? Um, and I'm going to say this is something that uh, we think a lot about at HRAI and other associations, I'm sure, have similar thoughts. What can we do on behalf of the whole sector? And uh, I'm going to say one of the things we need to do is we need to be leading the way rather than responding to government policy. We should be at the table with government helping to set the agenda rather than always passively being in response mode and taking what we get. Uh, we've experienced a, num a number of uh, examples of that in the last several years of policies that maybe definitely would have benefited from some industry input in terms of design, uh, regulations along the same lines, uh, tax changes. Uh, we have the example in British mm -hmm. Columbia of, a, of an in the introduction of a tax that had a, a, an immediate uh, impact on the industry and there was almost no consultation with industry prior. Um, that doesn't bode well. So one of the things we need to do as a, as a sector across the board is to send a signal to governments, to utilities, uh, governments at the provincial, federal, and even municipal level that we have solutions, we have ideas about um, leading the way in, in the drive to low carbon technologies. And, um, and, and really, we just need to insert, our, insert ourselves into that bigger discussion. A little example of that I, I will cite here, and, and that is the discussion around the impacts on the grid of uh, heat pump technologies, which a lot of people have expressed concern about. Um, you know, we've conducted research. Uh, I can share some of this research if anyone's interested in the, one of the links. Um, we've done research that shows that um, rather than relying 100% on air source heat pumps, which is kind of the 
in most discussions, the go-to technology, Jeremy did mention ground source heat pumps as an alternative. Uh, we've done research that shows the specific benefits of ground source heat pumps in relation to managing the grid because they, they don't peak anywhere close to the same level on the coldest day of the year. If you invest in ground source heat pumps en masse, that can create in, uh, when you scale it up, a quite significant reduction in peak impacts, which means saving savings on the, uh, the investment in new grid capacity. And it's quite a significant savings. Um, so that's, that's research that's helpful to the policy discussion. It doesn't really say one technology is better than the other. It's more about these are considerations that need to be thought through when we're talking about electrification. And of course, electrification isn't the only way to reduce carbon. There are other technologies that should be considered as well. Hydrogen is an obvious one to, to have some discussion about. But that's at the high level. Mm -hmm. At the uh, individual level, for I'm going to say for contractors, um, the simple answer is to get, a, get out ahead of the curve, to be proactive, to be thinking through in your business what you need to be doing today to be, you know, to take advantage of the opportunities that are ahead of you. We can run to catch up down the road, or you can be ahead of the curve and be a leader and position your company in a positive way uh, to deal with these inevitable changes. And a simple example that I'll cite of that is there, there is a whole suite of uh, programs and regulations and programs coming or in market already. Greener homes is one that's, that's an obvious one mm -hmm. that talk about whole home energy retrofits. And yet uh, there are very few companies out there that can deliver for consumers, for homeowners, the entire suite of services that home energy retrofits implies. They'll take care of the mechanical room. Another contractor will take care of the windows or the insulation or weather stripping or whatever. Very few companies are in a position to offer the whole suite of services. And I would suggest that HVAC contractors who think about leading with their HVAC expertise and broaden into some of those other services will be doing themselves a favor. They'll be doing their customers a favor and they'll be positioning, them, positioning themselves for long-term success. This is also a question that we've done some research on and be happy to share that about you know what residential HVAC contractors might want to consider in, in pursuing that type of uh, opportunity. I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, no, very good. Thank you for that. Becoming a little more all rounded. Uh, Gurbinder, I, you know, I was going to ask the same kind of question for you with re with regards to the uh, solutions that um, Electro Federation Canada members bring that align with these you know, societal changes that are really happening as we decarbonize and reduce emissions across the country. Sure, Doug. So almost every member of Electro Federation is aligning with the changes. I mean, they have to, there is no other option. They are all helping the customers and suppliers to implement sustainable practices across their value chain and, and throughout the life cycle of their products and solutions. Now, all are talking about optimizing the technology. I mentioned to you about the disruptions. So our members have already started reducing the, for example, the use of cardboard and plastic in the packaging. They have started reducing the use of gases in the painting process, uh, use of smart combination of heat pump and electric heat in buildings, as mentioned by my uh, 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 colleagues before. So our members have already started doing that. They're coming up with photovoltaic power generators, you know, using solar technology, uh, elevator modernization units, or heat exchange ventilation equipment. Uh, we have already seen in the news that there was a zero emission ferry, which has been introduced at Niagara Falls. And uh, this was uh, one of our very prominent manufacturing members was part of the project. Uh, building, as we all know, represent 40% of the primary energy used globally and energy consumption in buildings is projected to rise substantially. It is also indicated that 30% of energy in buildings is estimated to be used inefficiently or unnecessarily. I mean, that is why we have all these controls uh, which are being put in place. I don't know, uh, many of you might have heard that uh, one of our members has supported, the, supported two apartment buildings in Switzerland with carbon neutral energy production and with no cost for electricity or heating for the tenants. Uh, with photovoltaic modules installed on the front and, and on the roofs, and with two wind turbines put over there, renewable electricity is produced locally. So the production covers the energy demand for heating and cooling, 
and production of hot water for all residents. So you know, it's, it's just like managing traffic, switching from one source to another at optimal times, switching power on and off to manage uh, efficiencies and costs. So products are programmed to react on a number of factors, including time, source of energy, economics, demand, et cetera. So all this is happening as we speak. And as um, uh, the previous speaker mentioned, uh, I think it was Martin, that we need to have proper policies in place, which would help these going forward. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. We touched on this already. Um, and it's really a question that goes all the way across the board, but um, if these new technologies and systems are going to be employed to achieve uh, emission reductions that are required across the country, do we have the skilled labor pool today to succeed on this road to 2030 and ultimately 2050 as zero carbon uh, society? Um, I'm just wondering where you guys see the gaps today and what are we doing to develop the talent that we need? And Kevin, as a, a contractor, contracting company, I'm gonna start with you and maybe you can just let us know your insights on that. Yeah, so I think, I think, um, I think it was Martin who touched on this. It's interesting, you know, when, you, when, you, um, when you're dealing with a client and there's, a, whether it's a HVAC equipment, whatever it may be, the focus is typically always on installed price. And there's so much more that goes into it. There's the energy consumption. There's, there's, um, you know, the air tightness of a building. And it doesn't really matter if it's a residential building or a commercial building. But we really are lacking the skilled expertise to to uh, look at a building and, and the systems in that building and come up with solutions for that client. And solutions where we can say, here's what the financial cost over the life cycle of that equipment will look like for you. Because it, it is like heat pumps, and I know there's a lot of talk about heat pumps, whether it's ground source or, or air source. Today, if you put in a heat pump, it will absolutely under its life cycle be more cost effective than fossil fuel based natural gas. So it, it, it's inevitable, but we don't have a, a sales force out in front of the clients promoting that and showing them this is what it's going to look like over the next 15 years. It's kind of the, selling the long term solution. Yeah, just because what you put in today, if you stick with gas, and we have these conversations regularly with clients, you stick with gas, you're good, you're safe from a cost standpoint. But this is the carbon enemy moving forward. If you have an option, another option, you might want to look at that. Jeremy, I don't know, can you address where you're, in terms of uh, uh, the knowledge of, of the, the existing, you know, the industry when it comes to the technology we have today? Yeah, I guess from my perspective, it's more what I hear. Um, I'm not as in the, on the ground as Kevin mm -hmm. and uh, and Martin would be with respect to to trades and their training and, and kind of where we're going. But what I see as trends that I would pick up on is is that we don't have. I don't think we have a sufficient number of trained refrigeration and air conditioning mechanics out there right now to service this this change that's going to happen speaking specifically to heating and cooling systems and, and buildings. And so that needs to change. And I think, you know, much like, um, say, when COVID happened in the health sector, we saw the drastic need for nursing and for uh, personal support workers and for mental health practitioners. I think if we're talking about electrification and we're talking about a, a big change, um, we need to get the industry ready. So we need to make investments in training and bringing contractors to the to the you know to the point that they need to be to service this change that just needs to happen. And I think um, what I'm concerned about, if that doesn't happen, is that we go back and we start to get substandard installs, or you know we get equipment coming to our market that's really not designed for cold weather, and that goes in um, like some equipment that I've seen starting to come over. So I I, I would hope that we don't start to create. Um, a demand for substandard equipment as a result of just not having the people out there to do certified, um, you know, proper installs. And picking up on Martin's point that he made before about bringing, um, you know, different, typically different um, businesses together to, to sort of leverage, 
what I've seen is that, you know, energy advisors get involved, per, let's say through Greener Homes or some other incentive program, and they offer maybe um, a, a heat loss and heat gain calculation with HOT 2000. They offer some suggestions for energy upgrades. Um, and then you've got mechanical systems designers that are trained to do proper heat loss and heat gain calculation, duct sizing. And then you've got contractors that do the equipment install and the equipment scoping on the job. To me, if there's an opportunity to bring those three services sort of into one entity, I, I, I would see that as a opportunity to, to leverage, leverage this opportunity to create a, a successful business model. Just from the outside looking in kind of as a researcher and being in this field for a while, that's some mm -hmm. of the things I see. Okay. Martin? Um... I, I know we, we talk about this skilled trades gap, uh, you know, and in, in, in all kind of skilled trades, but what's what's being done to address it? What have you seen? Have you, is there progress? Is there light at the end of this tunnel? Well, there's certainly um, uh, a bit of a vision for what's needed. I'm going to say, um, I'm happy to say HRAI has actually been working on kind of trying to strategically lay out a plan of training. Um, one thing I tell people in government you know, this is an industry that actually our industry loves training. Our members eat it up. Um, they're very technically minded, but whether or not they'll absorb the training that's needed to do this pivot, to move into the, um, the low carbon technology world at a pace that will satisfy the government's expectations around the targets that have been set, that's a big open question. And so um, our request of government in terms of support is to help accelerate the transition uh, through a variety of means. And I, there's several thing, uh, elements to it that I would touch on. One is um, retraining for existing workers, existing tradespeople in our, our sector. There's a definite need, I'm going to say, for the most part, the good news is most HVAC technicians, let's say with a refrigeration background or a sheet metal background, probably have 75 or 80% of what they need. They understand how systems work, but they may not be completely up to date on the latest technologies uh, around heat pumps, they may not be um, fully up to speed on the new gases that are coming into the market. Um, they might, might not be up to speed on some of the design considerations that Jeremy raised about sizing and equipment specification. There's a definite need to retrain existing workers. So that's gotta be part of the plan. A second part of the plan has to be around developing a pathway into the industry that's attractive and that trains people appropriately for the skills that will be needed. And, and on that one, we're working pretty aggressively across the country to get provinces, which is where trades are regulated, to adopt a residential heat pump trade, for lack of a better term. Because uh, as Jeremy said, there's a desperate shortage of refrigeration mechanics. That's the, the license that generally is required to install heat pumps. There are not enough people with that certification across the country to get the job done in the residential market. So we propose that a, a residential version of that trade like exists in Ontario and Manitoba, should be adopted in other provinces. It's ideally suited to the needs of that sector. All of those things I believe are achievable and in our industry can, you know, we have a bit of a plan to do some of those things, but by far the biggest need, Kevin touched on it earlier, it's the need to um, get people to understand how to sell these technologies, how to sell these solutions. Um, understanding the, the specific benefits of heat pumps, control systems that can manage hybrid arrangements, um, VRV and uh, VRF uh, uh, systems. There's, there's all kinds of new technologies that people have to technically understand how to install and service them, but also how do you sell them, particularly when the price point is a bit higher than, than what people are used to. And you know, as a simple example, very few in our membership today know how to sell against carbon price. Like what do you, you know, you can talk about the installed cost of a product today, what will that cost of operation be five, 10 and 15 years down the road based on the trajectory of carbon fuel pricing um, with or without a federal carbon tax? But if you're not thinking about that and presenting the alternatives to your customers, you're really doing a disservice. And yet very few in our membership today can speak to that. So that's where I would say the biggest need by far and the one that's hardest for contractors to absorb is that need to sell the technologies to sell the solutions that they have in their arsenal. Gavinder, do you have anything to add to the uh, training necessary to move forward? Uh, Doug, of course, uh, reskilling and retraining is definitely required. Um, 
there are, and also many times it has been brought to the attention, oh, you know, the immigration process is flawed and we need more people to come in to help the industry. I feel that reskilling, retraining number one, and, and maybe reaching out to the high schools within the country should be the first priority before we take any anything further uh, to that. Um, one thing which I would like to add, I think someone uh, mentioned about th there is a need for the government to bring all the stakeholders together. And this is one of the frustrations which I see and feel when we talk about stakeholders, people are, or the organizations are not able to identify the so-called stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? So like in, on this platform, we have HRAI, we have Electro Federation together. So all these should be brought together and the government should be then developing the policies uh, going forward. Otherwise, we'll not be able to come with a solution which will be conducive for the entire population in this country. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've got a few questions that have come in. I'm going to do one more question that I had uh, ready for you guys, and then we're going to jump to our, uh, our uh, listener questions. But it had to do with the, the talk of the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, machine learning, that sort of thing is, is really a, a across all industries. Um, smart technology to, to make buildings and homes operate uh, cleaner and more adaptable. And Kevin, I was just wondering if this digitization of building controls, mechanical and electrical, is really a, one of the solutions for optimizing energy efficiency in buildings that, that is going to be playing a larger role going forward, or are you seeing it today? Yeah, we've been, uh, it, we've been seeing it today, and, and that's something that's been ramping up over time. Um, uh, technology, uh, especially um, you know, building intelligence and technology, is, is starting to ramp up. It always... It, it always confuses me how we, our vehicles seem to be smarter than our building. So, you know, my building, my vehicle tells me when to change the oil, but my building can't. So it's very, uh, it's very interesting. And we talk about this often at, at Modern about how we can help to change that. So, you know, if you can't measure it, uh, how can you improve on it? Um, you know, uh, Jeremy spoke about continuous commissioning. If you have a robust automation system, and, and obviously I'm talking about larger buildings, you're not going to do this in your house, although... The Google Nest thermostats are pretty intelligent device as well. So, um, but continuous commissioning can save you all kinds of energy. Um, measurement and verification can be continuous. And, and really we see the future as, you know, I believe the day will come where the building actually initiates the calls for, for, for action and service on their own, rather than doing it on a scheduled basis or, well, it's already too hot or it's already too cold. I can call for service. We should be able to, well, we can today do that with automation. Jeremy, I just wanted to, to go back to you for a second because you talked about uh, smart switching uh, controls. Um, could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. What I was referring to there is, if, for example, in Ontario, um, parts of BC um, and you know, parts of the prairies as well. We've, we've got a lot of gas furnaces in people's houses that have been recently replaced through, say, a previous uh, government eco-energy retrofit program, let's say. And if you've got that high-performance gas furnace, maybe you're not wanting to switch it out before the end of its life for a fully electric heat pump. So maybe you can add a heat pump to that furnace. And if you do that, and you're in a region like Ontario with time of use rates, a single switch over temperature won't get you the the only way to switch between um, operating modes so if you have a smart switching control that based on the time of use based on the performance of the heat pump and based on the performance of the furnace which are known quantities um, then it can tell by being connected to the internet it can tell the system when to switch to gas because it's cheaper for gas or when to switch to heat pump because it's cheaper to run the heat pump and you could also have it a switch based on um, GHG reductions. So you could say, you know, for example, in Ontario, we know the electricity independent electricity system operator publishes the grid mix um, in real time. So you could know, okay, right now, you know, the marginal uh, electricity generator is a gas combined cycle turbine. It just kicked on. Um, I'm going to switch back to gas because that's lower GHG emitting or Right now, the grid's running mostly hydro and nuclear, so I'm going to switch to heat pump because it's lower GHG emitting. Those kind of things, like Kevin said, and, and Gravinder also 
mentioned, you know, we're, we've got the technology out there. Maybe it's just not across the board and, and being talked about and, and sold, but it, uh, it's there. I've got a question from Vince here who's asking lots of talk about electrification. Is biomass heating, wood chips and pellets on the radar in the mechanical industry? Anyone want to jump in on that one? I will. We've, it's absolutely on the radar. Um, we've actually just invested and secured a, a large quantity of renewable natural gas to support our clients. So this is natural gas that's produced off organic waste. Um, it is being injected into the natural gas line. So it is, it is co-mingled with the fossil fuel based natural gas, but you're buying that environmental attribute and, and credit for that down the line. So we are looking at that as well. Yeah, I could add that I, I'm, it's not my area at Natural Resources Canada, but I work with several colleagues whose area it is. And I know that there's several biomass projects, um, mainly in remote locations in which uh, diesel is extremely high cost. And so to get off diesel, if you're below the tree line, you know, biomass is a logical alternative. And there's some new technologies that are um, co-generating um, electricity and, and heat with biomass that, that I've seen quite successful. Uh, we also have a question here. One of the biggest HVAC industry's challenges is that usually mechanical contractors are looking for the least expensive solutions and not necessarily the most efficient. How can this be changed so contractors pursue green efficient solutions? It's, it's obviously, that's a, that's a really critical point. Um, it, it's been my observation over many years that uh, um, contractors, HVAC contractors are really good at identifying the optimal solution for their customers. And they kind of, you know, they, they think about problem solving and, you know, they know what they know. And so they're going to bring all the knowledge they have and identify the most cost effective solution and recommend that. And it's, it's what the market drives towards. It's what it's, it's, it's almost part of their DNA, I'm going to say. But I think that uh, it's already been suggested earlier that maybe contractors need to think about long term costs long-term benefits. Um, that's not really part of the calculus that, that's thought through when, when these systems are being sold. So more of that needs to happen. And I'm gonna say uh, to some degree, contractors have to learn also to listen to what their customers want. And what we're finding is more and more customers are saying, I will pay more for a system that I know is gonna get me to zero carbon. That's becoming a more important value for, for uh, the end use customer. Maybe not where quite where we should be, but that's something contractors need to respond to as well. So uh, it's an acknowledged problem. Um, it's part of the reason we said earlier that uh, we need to find ways to help contractors to sell these systems. And that's part of it. It's not really just about upfront installed cost. It's about long-term costs and factoring in societal costs as well into the, into the equation. Uh, what about the use of district heating for denser areas? I don't know, Kevin, have you guys touched on that at all or? Yeah, so, so certainly um, there's district heating systems in Vancouver and, and Toronto. And um, I think it's a great go-to in a dense area like that. It's, uh, it works very well. It, it helps to get rid of um, cycling and helps to, you can share heat between the heating side and the cooling side more efficiently and effectively. So yeah, I think those are uh, great options. In terms of refrigerant options, are there plans to limit the number of options to make it practical or is it going to be free market? I'll maybe quickly comment on that one, Doug. Yes. I saw that question in advance. It's a very tricky question. Okay. Because the, the options that are being limited are not being limited by the industry. They're being eliminated or limited by regulation. Mm -hmm. So the phase out of uh, global warming gases um, really puts the refrigerant industry, which is, you know, a lot of brilliant chemists involved in some of these large corporations that are working on refrigerants. Trust me, they're working very hard to identify new chemical compounds mm -hmm. that, you know, deliver the cooling, the, the, the um, attributes of a good refrigerant without causing some environmental hazard. And the, the, the options today going forward as we phase down uh, global warming gases, phase out uh, HFCs and the like, um, it's becoming a narrower range of products that will work effectively. Things like CO2, things like uh, 
hydrocarbon refrigerants, flamm flammable refrigerants. These are going to create challenges for the industry, but um, what, the an what the answer will be five or 10 years from now, it's very hard to say. Uh, maybe the industry will develop a product that can achieve all the, check all the boxes, but right now that looks like there isn't one that's going to be that silver bullet. But it's an interesting question and it's something the industry is just going to have to work on very diligently. Yeah. Jeremy, maybe this one's for you. Heat pumps appear to be the equipment for electrification. However, the service life of the heat pump utilizing electrical power compressor generally has a 20 year service life. How do you see the heat pump after 2030 when the heat pumps required to be replaced? This would be similar to the homeowner when he replaces his refrigerator at home. Should renewable gas be an option using the absorption heat pump? Hmm. Yeah, interesting question. A lot in there. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I think it's hard for us to know what's going to be the go-to system um, 20 years out. Uh, we know that you know renewably integrated systems such as solar assist. Um, maybe at that point, I can see a future where we're being deterred from connecting. PV to the grid. Um, there might be preferences for using maximizing on-site use. So integrating compact storage, integrating uh, battery storage, integrating renewables so that you're using as much as you can directly on site. I can imagine that being something in the future. Uh, in terms of what replaces the, the compressor and the heat pump, hard, hard to know. I think we're going to, we're going to be at a time where new refrigerants will be in the market like uh, like Martin referred to and where that's going to drive the industry is I think hard to know at this point. We know 2025 we're going to see chillers facing the GWP of 750. Um, you know residential equipment will be soon after that and then as we move a little further on in the decade it's going to be GWP of 150 and that's going to mean a, a complete change in refrigerants. That's not going to be R32. That's going to be something that's in the A2L category like uh, like Martin referred to. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the crystal ball is hard to see, but that's a few thoughts that I would have looking out 20 years. Okay. I'm going to do, uh, we've got two more questions here. This one's directed at you, Martin. Uh, how can we learn more about selling against future carbon pricing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay. I'm going to say stay tuned. Um, some okay. contractors are doing it today. Um, they, they've done the math. It's just math. Right, but you have to take the data that are presented by the federal government. What's the what's the trajectory of uh, carbon pricing, and what how does that work into the cost of natural gas or or whatever uh, fuel you're using today? Um, the challenge we have that we've identified and are going to try to solve as HRI is um, customers won't believe that analysis if you just present it as like I've done the math. They're going to say, well, sure you've done the math, but how do I? Why would I believe you? What we'd really like is something that's validated by Intercan, validated by utilities perhaps. So it, maybe it's an app, maybe it's a, a you know a, a, a piece of software that we can put out in the market. You know, I, I suspect within a, a year or so we're going to see probably multiple versions of this, but it is something that HRI is exploring that we'll put into the hands of our contractor members because you want to have something that's third-party, objective, that you can use as a selling tool to give people data with which to make uh, these types of decisions. So hasn't been developed yet. I'm not aware of any that's, um, that's really convenient and available to the market, but I think that will happen very soon, if not by the private sector, then by an association like HRAI or, or a partner. There's an air source heat pump sizing and selection toolkit that we recently published in the, in the last year. And there is some automated calculations in there that will give you an estimate of GHG reductions, energy savings and the like. Um, so depending on what your backup system is, depending on what kind of heat pump you're going after, there's webinars available, uh, training webinars that are that are posted. So I'd, I'd encourage people to go check that out and maybe not have all the answers like Martin said, but perhaps it, it's a useful tool to take a look at. Okay, thank you. And Jeremy, I might uh, throw this question at you quickly. Uh, a term terminology clarification. I'm hearing different terms from different sources. Hybrid versus dual fuel systems. Are they the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a quick one. Yep. Perfect. I would say so. Okay. We're kind of picking up on the terminology the day of hybrid systems with hybrid cars. You know, everybody talks hybrid. So 
dual fuel. Yep. Today's version is hybrid. Okay. That's awesome. It's two o'clock and uh, we said we were going to keep this to an hour. So I got to thank everyone who uh, participated today. Thank all of my panelists. Thank you guys for uh, spending the time and sharing, sharing your knowledge with our audience. I'd like to uh, acknowledge that 2030, it's eight years away. Um, the time now, it's now is the time rather to get on board uh, with what's happening and, and be part of the change. I think that's kind of the message that came across today is, is manufacturers are accepting this and contractors need to acknowledge and be aware and, and get on board with, with what's going on. With that, I'd uh, like to once again thank our sponsors for today's event. That was Eaton and Mitsubishi Electric Heating and Cooling. I think with that, again, panelists, thank you so much for your time today. And everyone who attended today, thank you. This wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have happened without you registering and uh, participating. Thank you for those who asked the questions. And until next time, uh, farewell. Thank you, everyone.